Yes, I'm Dr. John Brandenburg, and I'll be talking about the utility of fusion, fusion, hybrid, nuclear power, on Mars mission. I am a fusion guy. I've been a fusion guy ever since I started graduate school back in uh, 1975. So what I'm telling you is the result of an epiphany that I had about two years ago. And I'll just mention the following talk was given at Stage 2 meeting in Albuquerque, which was all new ideas regarding space and energy. If you have a talk you want to give at this conference and want to make sure it actually passes unless you come to Stage 2. Anyway, motivation I'll be talking about. Uh, the breakthrough is compact and safe fission, fusion hybrid nuclear energy for Earth and space, and application for Mars-based power, and then I'll summarize. Okay, motivation, Mars site power and the astronauts have already spoken on this. They are not going to Mars without nuclear based power. Uh, they're not going to use windmills, they're not going to use solar because you have a dust storm and it will shut down everything like that for months. And they will be risking their lives enough um, for a planet with so little atmosphere, Mars has terrible weather. And so uh, the astronauts must have nuclear power for a Mars surface base, either, either from radiothermal generators or something. Uh, there's an additional slight motivation that I need not go into, just watch the news tonight. So, uh, energy distribution history. Uh, the fastest growing energy source on this planet is coal. Uh, we have CO2 levels going up. You can see the seasonal fluctuation. The other graph is oxygen levels. The oxygen level in this atmosphere is dropping, about seven parts per million per year. Now, we have a lot of parts per million to go until we cut down the Amazon. So, as your life support officer, I must report a slight problem. Houston, we have a problem. So, the solution is, of course, E equals MC squared. The stars do it, the sun does it, we should do it. Now, in 1994, I contend the human race had a breakthrough. We ran the TFTR, uh, Princeton Tokamak Reactor, wonderful invention of Andrei Sakharov, the great Russian scientist. And they got 30% of the energy out that they put in, so they were producing. Uh, 10 megawatts of pure fusion power. It came out, a lot of it in neutrons, but it was the first significant fusion energy release in a controlled fashion on Earth. Now, if they had put uh, a uranium blanket around that thing, they would have gotten 10 times more power than they put in. What we're looking at here is a grim fact, what I used to regard as just a grim fact of life as a fusion researcher before my epiphany, before it suddenly appeared to me like a ray of sunlight on a dark day. You'll notice that DT, the blue line, is much higher than any other lines, especially D helium 3, our favorite, because it produced D helium 3 uses non radioactive fuel and it doesn't produce. If you make, do it right, much radioactivity. It doesn't produce any neutrons. However, nature likes neutrons. DT fusion is much, much easier to do than D helium 3. Now, I'm a believer that D helium 3 will eventually power Buck Rogers spaceships, but for the meantime, we're stuck with DT because it's easy to do and we can get the fuel. Now, here's another interesting thing. Here's fission and fusion compared. Nuclear fission, we're releasing the energy from old supernova. It's star power, but just trapped in the uranium atoms and uh, thorium. We get 250 MeV a pop out of a fission reaction, and it comes out as heat. And this is why we've been able to harness fission. Not as well as we liked, but we've been able to harness it. 
Now, fusion, which is harder to do, you only get 18 MeV per reaction. So you're working very hard to get one-tenth, less than one-tenth the energy per reaction. And the other problem with DT fusion, the easiest fusion to make, is that almost all the energy comes out, not as heat, but in a very powerful neutron, which tears materials to pieces. Even if we could build a tokamak fusion reactor that would produce 30 times more energy than it put out, we'd have to replace the first wall on the thing every year. And that'd be low level rad, it'd be high level rad waste. So fusion has, this is why people joke that fusion is and always will be the energy source of the future. <laughs> and as a fusion diehard, I had a great moment of insight where I suddenly realized, why are we fighting nature? Suppose man's best friend is not the dog, it's the neutron. Suppose we use these neutrons from fusion that we can now make, we can make these things in enormous amounts. Why don't we use them to make fission better? This is a breakthrough, conceptually. We can take fusion energy that we can make now and cure the ills of fusion. We can take a fusion reactor that we can build now and make it the core of a fission reactor and run the control of the fission blanket, make it critical by the neutrons we produce from the fusion. The fusion blanket acts as a power multiplier. So we have, as a result, an electronically controlled fission reactor. It would be much safer, much cleaner. Instead of controlling it with control rods, we control it electronically by the plasma and the core. It's, if it starts misbehaving, we shut it down. It's much easier to cool in the afterheat. Also, the 14 MeV neutrons can do nuclear transformations on especially long-lived nuclear waste. We can burn up the nuclear waste. Suddenly the nuclear waste is worth money. It's dangerous because it's still got energy in it. We can put it next to a fusion reactor producing 14 MeV neutrons and radiate it and convert it to 50 year waste instead of 10,000 year waste. There are numerous studies being done on this now. It's sort of an idea that suddenly time has come. We can solve the long lived waste problem from fission and we can make much safer hybrid reactors with fusion neutron uh, generator cores and fission blankets. So, we can take advantage of all of our pressurized water technology and put fusion generator cores in it to control it better. So, the advantages are that fusion elements for hybrid power are much easier to build than they are for a, a, a pure fusion reactor. A pure fusion reactor burning DT cannot compete with a hybrid fission, hybrid fission fusion because you're getting so much more energy out of the, uh, the fission. We can also treat long-lived waste and the hybrid allows safe breeding of fission fuels. Instead of having a breeder reactor, which is an atomic bomb, running right at the, being run in a very frustrated way. You can make, uh, you can irradiate thorium or even uranium-238 and convert it into a fission fuel. So the energy crisis is solved. There's a little asterisk there in theory. And I have run this idea, I ran this idea past my old thesis advisor, Richard F. Post, who is a wonderful man, he's a noble, He's been working all his career to bring fusion power to humanity, and he frowned. <laughs> he considered this defeatist. But I said, no, Dick, it makes sense. This is, this is working with nature rather than fighting it. So, now, so we can solve this, we can solve technically, the technical fix for Safe, clean nuclear energy on Earth is available by combining the new fusion 
power we have with fission and making it better. Now, how does this apply to Mars? We can launch a space nuclear reactor and have it completely inert. We can use then a fusion neutron source on board to activate a thorium fission blanket or even a uranium-238 blanket all the way to Mars so that by the time it reaches Mars, it has crit reached criticality. So, the problem right now with any space nuclear power is that it's expensive, and half the expense is lawyers. Because when you try to launch something like a nuclear reactor into space, people are going to just jam the courthouse steps with lawsuits. Uh, the other problem is a lot of space nuclear power things, they like to make them compact, which means they use very high grade, almost weapons grade uranium in them. And I saw one design and this guy says, well, I said, why is it built this way? He says, so if it goes in the ocean, it won't do a prompt critical. Because if you have even have it kind of dispersed, all the fuel rods dispersed, if it goes into the ocean, the ocean water will moderate it and you'll have a prompt critical. So you have to, you have to, you have to put all of your safety oriented for the thing falling out of the sky and into the uh, on launch, into the ocean, or falling out of orbit from some accident, and the cleanup that's going to be required for especially a reactor that's operated in space. So, however, we can solve that with a thorium uh, fission blanket. It can be launched inert. If it goes in the ocean, you go out and salvage it. Bring it back, clean it up, launch it again. What does it look like? Well, this is just a very simple diagram, of course. You have a DT fusion neutron source, either a little miniature tokamak or some of the other devices they're building now. You have a beryllium or um, bismuth neutron multiplier, it multiplies the neutrons by about a factor of uh, 3 to 10. And then you have a thorium blanket, which is completely inert. All of this stuff's completely inert. Then you turn it on in space, it flies a whole transfer orbit to Mars, takes 10 months to get there. By the time it gets there, you've been running DT fusion <coughs> neutron source, and it's converted a lot of the uranium, uh, a sizable amount of the thorium into uranium-233, which now means you have a perfectly good nuclear reactor that you can operate on Mars. Um, or you can bring it all the way to Mars, park it in a nice crater someplace, and uh, make this thing happen on Mars. But it would be good to take advantage of the full sunlight on the way to Mars to do this. So, um, we have a new tool in the toolbox that is compact fusion neutron sources. Now I'm going to just discuss very briefly some of the progress we've made on that. But we can have power on Mars, dust or no dust. Um, there's a big dust storm, instead of it being a crisis, people will just start uh, going to the DVD library to pass the time. So it will not be a crisis. Now, just to give you some idea of how much advances we have made as plasma physicists, we've actually gotten very good at this. We have actually solved the problem of confining plasmas and achieving fusion conditions. Most people don't realize that. They think that we're still, you know, stumbling around uh, trying to make this work. Or as one person said, trying to make the spaghetti stand, the wet spaghetti noodles stand on end. We can do that, as it turns out. It turns out you twist all of the wet spaghetti noodles together and make them into an endless loop. And they all, since they're all twisted together, they actually support each other. And to illustrate, uh, I'm going to show you an experiment we built 
for a probably ten dollars and ran it in a vacuum chamber. We made a miniature, what's called a torsotron, similar to a tokamak. Sir, and yes. Can you move your mic down? No, all that screeching will go away. Just take your mic. You got clipped here. I don't hear any screeching. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> sure. Sure. Thank you. Uh, can everyone hear me? Oh, yeah. That's okay, right. I'm sorry. I, I'm wearing a Mars t shirt, so there's no place to go. <laughs> so, anyway, I just want to say now I'm going to brag a little bit as plasma. I'm going to brag on plasma physics. We have solved this problem of plasma confinement for fusion. We've solved it two very simple ways I'm going to show you. Uh, there is, of course, the tokamak. Tokamak works great. One of the reasons it works so well is it lets the plasma do what it wants. A lot of the early attempts to make plasmas, confined plasmas for fusion, were based on forcing the plasma to do what we wanted it to do and thinking that that was the best way. As it turns out, the tokamak uh, works the best of all of the plasma confinement devices uh, because it actually is allows the plasma to self-organize itself. And another thing, a uh, reason a plasma, a tokamak works so well is that it's, it's a bagel, kind of a bagel. It's got minimum surface area for, for volume. So the heat tends to leak out of these plasmas on the surface. But anyway, the, the problem of plasma stability has been solved. And they found out the hotter the plasma gets, that is, the closer it gets to fusion conditions, the better it works. So uh, they've now made uh, great advances in making um, all sorts of donut-shaped plasmas. This is called a torsotron. Uh, it's my favorite because it's so simple. We built one <laughs> for about $10. We took a bunch of wire and wound it in a corkscrew pattern um, around a foam core that we bought at a craft store for making Christmas trees. Then uh, once we had it all okay. fastened down, we dissolved the core with acetone. Leaving the okay, and then we stuck the whole thing in a vacuum chamber and uh, charged it up with four car batteries. The result was that even though we didn't do a very good job at one part, the wires came loose, it still made a very nice donut of plasma immediately. And it ran as long as we had the car batteries working. So the secret is the twist. It's, you want the plasmas like a, to be a French donut, basically, uh, or a scrawler. They like to be uh, a, a twisted, Brain and roll. So, uh, if we could do that for ten dollars, and in fact, if we had enough power and made uh, cleared up some of them, we thought we could produce a lot of neutrons from this thing. If we were, if we were so inclined, but the uh, liability insurance wouldn't cover it, so we didn't. We didn't do that. Uh, there's another fusion device that's very successful. People are running them in their garages. All it takes is a window screen and chicken wire and a 6,000 volt power supply. Or uh, actually 60,000 volt is, is one of the best. But basically, it's called IEC. It's inertial electrostatic confinement. And I'll just give you an idea of what it looks like. Uh, we just made a geocentric, uh, geodesic kind of thing of wire, charged it up. You can actually do this at a, at a regular physics, in a high school physics lab with a vacuum chamber. Uh, you just make this kind of globe of wire, charge it up to uh, 400 volts, take down the uh, air pressure, and it will all start to glow, and then suddenly all the glow will detach from the wires and form a little star in the middle. And if you keep increasing the power and use hydrogen fuel, it'll start making neutrons. 
You can make 10 to the 14th neutrons per second now. They're doing this at the University of Wisconsin. So um, it's um, Lozinski's group and uh, Santarius. Santarius, you may not remember, but uh, he's a great hero of us in the fusion. He's the fellow who figured out that the helium-3 found by Apollo 11 could actually help power spacecraft later on Earth. We were all looking for a large source of helium-3, and he found it. Uh, it was, he found it by having a conversation with somebody who was analyzing the lunar samples over lunch. And they said, you know, it's really weird. The helium in the lunar stuff, lunar uh, regolith, is really full of helium-3. He says, oh. <laughs> so, um, we can make fusion simply and easily now. And uh, to show you how neat it is to do some of these low-cost experiments, the challenge is, of course, if you don't have a big budget, is to do something <laughs> interesting anyway. We went out and bought a microwave oven at a uh, Goodwill, uh, ran some television cable in it. Don't do this at home, folks. And we piped the microwaves out of the microwave oven into the vacuum chamber where we had this plasma running. And we turned on the microwave oven and set it for popcorn. And the plasma inside the sh electrostatic shell shrank and got brighter. There you can see um, it's gotten brighter and bluer, more compact and bluer. So we were extremely pleased and rushed off to a conference, of course, to publish this. Uh, we haven't seen if we can produce more neutrons this way, but we believe we can. So, so what I am telling you is um, us plasma physicists have not been spending large amounts of money for the past 40 years for nothing. We have actually solved this problem. The only problem is, is the physics of fission, fusion itself is not really amenable. This was my big insight, my big moment of truth. Pure fusion using neutrons, which is the easiest thing to do, is not really practical. Pure fusion, fusion mixed with fission, is, however, can cure a lot of the ills of fusion. Fission is where the energy is. It's where the money is. Fission is good at making energy. Fusion is great at making neutrons, which are, can be used for chemical alchemy, basically, to transform nuclear waste and render it safe. And it can also take an, ine an inert piece of thorium on Earth and have it arrive at Mars as the core of a perfectly good fission reactor. It'll keep you alive during a long dust storm. So, I just wanted to brag that we have solved this problem. We haven't solved it the way we wanted, but we have solved it. And um, we can demonstrate this now. Once you know where you, what you're doing, it's very easy to demonstrate in just like a um, high school physics lab with a vacuum chamber and a power supply. So, in summary, <coughs> hybrid fusion fission uh, offers a near-term, safe, clean nuclear power for Earth and space. We can solve the energy crisis with physics now. So, the energy crisis now has a technical fix. As usual, of course, that is only one maybe 10% of the problem. The rest of it is economic, it's political, it is perceptual, conceptual. All of these things have to be solved. Uh, I be started becoming a big critic of windmills. We built a lot of them in Wisconsin. I drive around, none of them are moving most of the time. But a friend of mine advised me that, John, at your age, there's no time to start jousting in windmills. <laughs> so, I can offer an alternative, though, for Earth and for space. Fusion neutron source powered by solar power can transmute worthless thorium 
Perfectly safe thorium. Suitable only for making lamp uh, shrouds, uh, gas lamp shrouds. In the visionable U-232 en route to Mars that you can power a Mars colony with. So we can launch it inert and activate it on the way or on the surface of Mars. And it'll be very, there, there, we will not, in the society we will create on Mars, we will not allow lawyers. <laughs> Yay! We won't have to kill all the lawyers later. We will simply just not allow lawyers on Mars. And so no one can file any lawsuits. <laughs> but this is my goal. <laughs> anyway, thank you very much. You know, realizing that, that fusion, as you were, what they say in German, helped pot for your bailiwick. Yes. Um, that aside, um, with energy production being the end game. Yes. Have you? That is the goal. Have you ruled out entirely a thoron breeder? Uh, liquid fluoride. Oh, those are those are marvelous. I mean, there's um, one in Scandinavia that's a big one that is. I mean, oh, supposedly it's working beautifully. See, one of the problems us hybrid people now experience is we go to the fusion people and they say this is defeatist. You know, no, I'm, I'm and, not, uh, but then you go to the fusion people and they say, oh, we don't need any fusion. No, I'm not saying mm -hmm. either. I'm just saying, w w have you have you written off? Oh, oh no, no, no. I, fluoride. I'm, I'm pretty much a proponent of all the forms of fission energy that they, I mean, fission obviously works really well. It's just the safety problems and the nuclear waste problem and the public perception problem after Fukushima and Chernobyl. And, but you don't see a, a big problem with the lifter compared to the others? Uh, the, 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 the uh, oh, oh, I think uh, running thorium cycle on Mars might be a wonderful thing. Well, there's tons of it on Earth. I mean, it, oh, it's as it's as abundant as lead. Yeah. There's as much thorium as there is as lead. I mean, it's three times more abundant than. You know, by the way, why people don't use thorium on Earth? Because it doesn't make good nuclear weapons. Uh, <laughs> that is that is the new the nuclear power industry kind of was encouraged by the government as an adjunct to the nuclear weapons program. So um, that's why we don't use thorium, but we should be using thorium. Right. Thank you. Yes. An H-bomb is basically your concept. Yes. It's an enhanced A-bomb. That's right. They put a uranium jacket around the fusion. fusion. Uh, you'll find my talk tomorrow interesting. Uh, but. Basically, yes, uh, all hydrogen bombs in the arsenal use this principle. They use the fusion neutrons to fission very cheap uranium-238 uh, or thorium in the jacket of the hydrogen bomb, and it doubles the yield. And they've been doing that ever since they built hydrogen bombs, it turns out. That's not classified. It's on Wikipedia. <laughs> uh, oh, yes, you, and then I'll get you. Yes? Accumulate the sorry, you already what is the power output of a system like that? <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to discuss that with Governor Turkin. Uh, again, oh no, oh you can make, uh, people have, uh, George Miley, who's a brilliant nuclear and fusion guy, has come up with a thing where he can actually add a active fusion fuel rod to just an ordinary nuclear reactor to control its criticality with fusion neutrons. And I'm hoping he gets to, he's already got a patent on it. So it's, uh, I'm hoping he gets to try that. So that you can do this, you can, all of the light water fission stuff you see, you can immediately just transfer to this hybrid stuff. So it can have, you can make them as powerful as you want. And compact for space? Uh, yes. I believe that can be done. It's, it's kind of a new engineering problem, but uh, but it, yes, we can make it very compact. Uh, oh, first, Bob, I'll get to you in a second. Yes, question. How small do you think this system could be made? Well, because we can make very small neutron sources now with this electrostatic technique, they're like a light bulb. We can actually, because that's producing a lot of the neutrons, it, it 
you can make, you can get away with less critical mass for the reactor. You can make the reactor more compact. So I believe we can make, uh, but they have made very small uh, compact nuclear reactors. We can make them even smaller with this technique, I believe. I hope you will see this in your lifetime. Yes, Bob? Yeah, if you surround the reactor with a fissile blanket, uh, then you can't meet trigger pressure. Yeah. So have you looked at that possibility of using that type of material as a source of neutron? Oh, yes. Uh, yes, I've had uh, discussions with the people of Wisconsin, and they said, oh, we should probably use DD. However, you can put uh, a lithium, it turns out you can put a lithium blanket in there and breed tritium um, and get some of the, um, uh, basically... Lithium is a neutron absorber, and you'll be using up your neutrons. In other words, in a typical yeah. Uh, Bob, that's a very good point. One of the nice things, though, about having beryllium or bismuth is you can, the, the 14 MeV neutrons come out and they have so much energy, they actually knock several neutrons out of these other atoms, out of these other nuclei. So you can get neutron multiplication just by a 14 MeV neutron hitting a, a beryllium, it'll spit out two or three neutrons. So you can either use one of those neutrons because the lithium breeds can breed tritium thermally. You're skeptical. It, it will have to be. Right, okay, let's just, how does it work? Will it work with DD? It will work with DD. The only thing is, is it's harder to make. Um, you know, DD has a lower reaction rate. Um, You can see DD, uh, you have to work a little bit harder to get the same kind of neutron output. But there are neutron multiplication schemes, so we can have a, it, it turns out you don't need 14 MeV neutrons to make the, tri, the lithium into tritium. You can actually use, they can be done, at, can be done at thermal energies, and that means you can do mo neutron multiplication. But, but I, I agree, it's, it, it, you have to be very careful doing this thing. I would just send along a tank of tritium, but uh, some people wouldn't want to. Or you could send helium, uh, no. No, okay, you'd have to send, uh, yes, a tank of tritium along to Mars, maybe. That's an unmanned ship. Yes? Uh, um, how would it play out with helium-3 as a fuel as far as... Oh, well, helium-3, uh, is a wonderful fuel for uh, making pure fusion energy. I visited the Jet Tokamak um, in England, and they had just gotten done producing 100 kilowatts of pure fusion power with no radiation, no neutrons whatsoever. It was incredible. They had uh, they they using ra using microwaves. They heated the helium three because it has a different charge to mass ratio, and kept the deuterium cold. So you had these hot helium threes hitting these deuteriums and making helium three, and they said that the whole chamber filled up with hot uh, protons, which don't uh, don't hurt anyone because they stay trapped in the magnetic field. And the whole thing was marvelous. But the the problem is uh, the uh, you know making helium three, you have to get about three times the temperature to get the helium three to work, and just getting this, you know, getting DT to work is hard right now, but we'll get better at this. I believe this will be, I believe we will have helium-3 powered uh, spacecraft where the, it'll be just like Buck Rogers, you know, where they have the engine room back there, uh, and they'll handle it just like a natural gas flame. Okay, I, was, I was actually also wondering, I think you just answered it, but if this hybrid concept in any way modifies the near-term technical feasibility of helium-3. Uh, I think, um, I don't think it does, but they're already, uh, we were going to order some helium-3 for one experiment we were doing. They're, they're making a lot of progress on fusion stuff, especially tabletop stuff, and we were going to 
buy some helium-3 to try and make some helium-3 reactions, and they said, well, we're all oversubscribed. Uh, a bunch of people came in and ordered all the helium-3 we could make, and they were from General Atomic. So, so, uh, so people are working on making, helium-3 is kind of the holy grail of fusion right now. Anyway, thank you very much.